I think we'll start. So this is Espresso from the Angel Swing account. And um, we can do our um, usual intro. And then if Anna joins, then we'll bring her up as a speaker. If not, you'll share a headset. Um, yep. So um, we are the Angel Swing, uh, which is a community dedicated to indie artists and uh, uh, a lot of great artists and uh, collectors and a very cozy Discord. And um, I think, uh, as usual, let's start with Casper giving us the, the quick um, intro to how Angel Swing got started, and just for the, the new listeners today. Yeah, just a really quick one. I don't want to steal the thunder from the main event. Uh, so we are the Angel Swing, uh, the OGs, Yoon, myself, Espresso, Johannes and Rebel Rouser, who's here. We are pretty much driving this uh, little project of ours. Uh, and it started because we wanted to showcase uh, independent artists. And because we realized that independent artists are also underappreciated and undermarketed due to the lack of uh, marketing resources compared to the 10K PFP projects, for example. So, started out small with uh, uh, an on-cyber gallery featuring their art and the whole idea behind it is with a critical mass of artists showing off their art there's going to be a cross-pollination of viewers and collectors and we've grown pretty decently and I think we've done pretty well uh, the Angel Swing has expanded beyond art we now have a very cozy community um, thanks to our Discord website, we are even on YouTube and Spotify now. So, yeah, if you're an independent artist who needs a little bit of help with visibility for your art, do just hit us up. Uh, any one of us OGs here with a DM or join our Discord would we'll be happy to help. But, yep, enough intro about us. Uh, Espresso, take it away with the main event. Thanks for joining us, Scales. For sure. Glad to be here. Yeah, so we're very happy to have Scales team here with us today. And uh, Scales, the project has really taken our community by storm the last few weeks. And, and it's been so much fun. Uh, so really excited to dig in and, and learn everything about the, the project, uh, the art, the, the game theory, everything behind it. So um, Matt, why don't you start by, by introducing Scales and, and yourself and, and the project? Sure, sure, of course. So my name is Matt, and I'm one of the co-founders of the Scales Project. Of course, my beautiful partner, Anna, is the other half of the project. And we put this together um, starting probably, mm, let's say, March-ish of 2021. Anna started making work for the project. And since probably about... December, we've been converting them into scales. Uh, it's a one of one project, but it's also 10K. I'm sure everybody is pretty familiar with the concept that we've created where we divide Anna's abstract works into what we call scales and then use each one to uh, become an NFT and um, then that's not where it stops because we also gamified the project a little bit uh, so that if you collect four scales in a row in any of uh, the paintings, then you're able to join what we call the royalty club. And that is a pool of 5% royalties that is divided amongst all the members of the club on a monthly basis. So it's been a very interesting journey so far um, when we thought about the project in concept it was very exciting to think about all of the different aspects 
of the gamification and how we're bringing together these two different worlds, the 10K PFP world with the one of one art space. And we found it to be just a fantastic blend of things. It is a very ambitious and difficult project. Um, there is a very involved process to converting these physical works into NFTs, uh, especially in such large numbers. But each work is, as, as it says on the website, like a microcosm of the larger work. Uh, every NFT stands on its own as an individual work of art, but also it is a microcosm of the whole. And so it's such a different concept for the space. And we're just really excited that it's taken hold in the way that it has. We're, we're very honored to be part of the space. And I feel like we're sort of building a bridge between the 10K projects that have existed before and the one of one art space. And so we're very excited about that. And um, I think that it's it's fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. So you have really been doing an excellent job of launching this project, and and um, also the the art is amazing. So um, so I, I'm not surprised that it's it's doing as well as it's doing. Um, I think it's good if we kind of start by diving a bit into the art with community of artists and collectors. So naturally, very interested in hearing more about the the art, the, the motivation, the techniques. Uh, and and kind of where this idea came from to make artworks and then split them up. Yeah, so the idea was almost spontaneous, but it's a very serendipitous story. Uh, the way that the concept came about was actually through uh, the process of creating gifts, which just you know, it fans right into our idea of radical generosity and giving all of the pieces away for free. Uh, the story goes something like this. I was helping to create labels for a tincture that we were making for Christmas gifts. And the labels um, were using part of Anna's abstract works to create a uh, background for the labels. Um, I have a background in, in graphic design. And so when I was putting these together, I sort of had uh, like a realization that each of these scans that I had made for the labels was absolutely just as beautiful and if not more beautiful when zoomed in, almost like a fractal of the entire work. And so I was making these and then I thought to myself, hey, you know what? It might be one of the best NFT concepts if we were able to use the individual parts as an NFT. So it all sort of came together at one time uh, with the idea sort of pre-wrapped in my mind. And um, I said, you know, what if, what if we... What if we started segregating the works and producing NFTs out of the individual pieces? And it, uh, Anna loved the idea. And she said, she says, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's make 10,000 of them. <laughs> and so sort of a uh, famous last words there. Uh, we began the process of converting the works and, you know, it, it sort of snowballed after that because, you know, once you have an idea, that's great, but then it comes time to do the hard work. And that that I couldn't have anticipated what it would take to actually create the project, you know, from the, uh, the smart contract development to the websites that were necessary and everything else, it all had to come together. So we've been working very, very hard on the project. Um, I would say more than full time since at least December. And um, yeah, we began the process of converting the works and creating more works at more of a rapid pace for the project. And then um, as far as sort of the gamification of it goes, 
we were sitting there just mulling over the whole project and considering all of the implications. And I just thought it would be a really cool idea if we were able to give back to the community in some way and reward them for being collectors. Uh, doing it on a one-to-one -one basis didn't seem like the best plan. For one, it would dilute the pool. Um, and what I mean by one of one is like uh, if everyone who collected a single NFT could join the Royalty Club, then there would be no game. And also it would dilute the reward for anyone who managed to collect four. So, you know, instead of doing it like that, we've we conceptualized the game and put it together. And that was uh, another challenge when it came to coding the actual smart contracts and organizing how it would go. But so far, so good. I think it's been a success, and we're just really excited that we're able to give back to the collectors in some way, and uh, and it's been good. It's been very good. Yeah, thank you. So, um, yeah, this, this part, so the the project and, and the tech and all seems to work exactly as intended, so, which is great. And and we've seen enough in this space that that's not a given, right? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> So very, uh, very happy to see that, and, and uh, kudos to to you and the team for achieving all of the goals that you've set out there. Um, and also very interesting to see how it plays out going forward. So, and um, also managed to to bring Anna up to the stage here as a speaker, and um, also wanted to hear more about the the, uh, the technique used for the uh, abstract works which look amazing, by the way. Uh, so that would be a um, good thing to dive into a bit. OK, I see her at the top of the hill. I Hi. think she's coming on. There she I is. So you guys want to know all my secrets. <laughs> of course, yes. <laughs> Hi, by the way, thanks. For, I'm sorry I'm late, actually. It just It's always a challenge finding the signal here. and. Um, now, now I'm in the tall grass, and that's where the signal seems to be. So anyway, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having us today. So about the art and the techniques. Um, so in my, in my art career, I guess, you know, I've done a lot of different things, and I used to really focus heavily on technique, and um, I... I used to paint hyper real paintings where I would use these fantastically tiny little brushes to and to make big paintings. And I I mean, I was really straight that go beyond uh, representing something that already exists in the world and actually making something that is a discovery and so these abstract techniques i worked as an apprentice under this amazingly talented artist in la for two years his name's harry moody and he worked with and studied with gerhard richter where he learned these techniques as well and he was actually he is a contemporary of gerhard richter and so, but it was very like a Karate Kid, Mr. Miyagi situation, learning these techniques because, you know, I went in and for the first, I don't know, six months, even though like I, I was already a professional artist, I wanted to learn these techniques so bad that I would go into his studio and just mix paint for him and clean his studio and just kind of watch him. And then um have these really amazing conversations around like the the philosophy of art and what it is to make art but not just the product of art but like how do you be in the process of making art and i had this shift um between like seeing art as a product as something to be sold or something to be made and now i see art as like the moment of creation the process and that's what matters to me the most and so that's what i focus on and it 
I always get really esoteric, so I, I'm sorry. I can't help it. That's just the way I am. So feel free to ask me any questions. But to, to answer your question, basically, I paint with oil paint. Um, and my main tool of application is uh, plexiglass squeegees. So, um, and that is that is the main tool of how I apply the layers of paint over and over and over again. And many of the works that you see are sometimes like, they're between like 10 and 30 to 35 layers of oil paint. And as I've been creating more and more work for this project, I'm finding that the number of layers is kind of increasing as I'm kind of pushing the boundaries. So. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you, Anne. And a follow-up question to that. So uh, when do you know when it's done? Um, <laughs> I know when a painting is done, when it doesn't need anything more from me. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's that is like the toughest thing because, um, there's, there's a difference to me between making a work of art and um, getting to the point where it's pretty, right? Because that's easy for me. It's easy to make something that is like aesthetically beautiful or balanced or enough, you know, but what I'm interested in is like, what's on the other side of that? So, what I've been doing lately is, you know, I get to the point where in my mind, I'm like, wow, that's pretty. That's, oh, maybe that's done. And then I intentionally like mess up the painting a little bit. Like I'll drop a squeegee on it or like I'll completely ruin the paint and then I'll try to fix it. And, um, and I don't know, for me, when a painting is done, like, it's almost like this, um, it's like this primal feeling of like, you better not go any further. Stop, like slow your roll right now. Um, but all the time I go way too far. I destroy a lot of work going too far, but it's never actually destroyed because then I let it dry and it becomes what I call an underpainting or like the history of, the next incarnation. So that's pretty much how I know. Nice. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's super interesting. And, and June, as you have a question. Hi, Anna. Um, it's just really so fascinating to hear um, about your process. Um, and now I actually even want to make an apprenticeship with you in the woods because <laughs> I'm just such a big fan of uh, Gerhard Richter um, as well. And, um, and I, I try to... Um, experiment with this squeegee type of um, um, art myself a um, couple years ago and uh, it just, it's just it's 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 actually way more difficult than it looks like um, and um, I wanted to ask you so I've seen um, on your I think it was I'm not sure whether I saw this on discord but um, you actually work um, with on stretched canvas is this is this correct yeah, so I do so I was, both. Yeah, I was wondering how, if you like work with these squeegees, how how do you like, you mean you have to, um, without moving the, the cameras, I mean, if you like scrape uh, with, with the paint along the cameras, um, how can you, like if it's on, do you have like a tool where you can just like um, stretch this thing for the time when you paint on it or how do you do that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, yeah, for the for the larger works, of course, it has to be on stretch canvas. Like, there's no way to, that you would be able to um, do a large piece or any piece really without having a completely flat and uniform surface. And um, for the smaller pieces, um, I actually I built two like giant glass tables out of like these old doors that I found 
And so they, they were a pair of matching white doors. And so one of the tables is like, if you can imagine it, it's like, um, it's like a glass patio door, I guess. And that's, that's my pallet. And that's how much room I need for the pallet. And then the other, the other table I use for actually painting. And so I, I actually make sure that the, the canvas is extremely flat, like, um, so there are no wrinkles in it or anything before I apply the paint to it. But I also tape it down on all sides so it doesn't move. So yeah, it's, it's actually not, it doesn't take that much <laughs> effort at all. Just a lot of tape, like a lot of tape. <laughs> Okay, so tape is uh, <laughs> is kind of the, the answer. Um, and do you also work like wedding wedding wet, or um, do you wait like? I mean, I guess the process is probably it's it's very intuitive, right? I mean, um, it's probably hard to decide up front. Um, I was just wondering how long does it take for you to create such a painting? Like, can you do this all in one sitting, wet on wet, or do you just or does it take sometimes days and you wait until one layer is dry and uh, you work uh, more layers on it? I mean, I, I, um, you mentioned that you um, some paintings have like 30, to 30 layers of paint and uh, I mean, just will probably take like some time to create. Yeah, um, so, so I do both. When I start out, I start off with what I call is an underpainting. So a lot of times without giving too much away, <laughs> almost, and I, I, I always want to share everything, but my mentor is always like, don't tell people how to do this. <laughs> so I'll be, I'll be um, somewhat vague in this response, but I start off with like an underpainting and oftentimes that's done with brushwork and what the brushwork does, it creates like ridges for all of the paint to get caught on. Um, and sometimes I do an underpainting with a squeegee and that's just like basically three or four or three or four or five layers of paint that act as like the base for the painting. And then I let that dry. And that's really important because you need to have some texture already there in order for there to have like these really crazy patterns created and um, like that's important. And then when I go back into it again, after it's dried from that point on, it's wet on wet. And so if I, cause, like I said before, sometimes I go way too far and like, it looks really bad. You guys haven't seen any of these, but some of the paintings, a, a lot of them are atrocious. And if you see on the scales, like sometimes like you'll see the layer that's further, furthest back, you know, sometimes that's like the 12th or the 13th layer of paint. Right. But the, I would say like the last 10 layers are all wet on wet. So, because otherwise like you wouldn't be able to have the paint mixing in the process to create like these beautiful gradients and shapes and striations. So does that answer your question? Totally, perfect. It is, um, I think, as you mentioned that, um, your mentors advise you not to um, give too much away about <laughs> the process. And I think this is actually a good thing because um, that way we probably can like um, discover on our own how to create certain things. And on this way, we will create something completely new, I guess, um, even if we like prefer a certain style. But um, we will kind of make this like create this in our own, own unique way um, if we discover the process by ourselves. Yeah, and I, I totally agree with you. And that's so valuable, you know, and that's been, um, 
That's that's really what you just said there. It really drives me because, you know, I learned these techniques and they like sort of passed down to me and and I can see the the paintings that my mentor is making and I think they're beautiful and I love them, but I want to go further. I want, I know this sounds like I'm probably going to curse myself by saying this, but I want to go further than where Gerhard Richter went, specifically with this technique. I want to push it further and find, like, I have ideas for what I want to create, like, even on a large scale, that this, this scales project, it's allowing me to experiment so much because out of necessity, because I have to create so much. So like any given time I sit down to the canvas or I get into my studio, I'm like, okay, well, like I, I feel like this permission to F up you know what I mean? And I feel like giving yourself permission to fail and to experiment is so huge. Um, and I think that part of that is like, it's really, really valuable to not know what the hell you're doing. <laughs> I don't know. It, it's like one of the best ways to learn anything and to, to really find your own style and find like find something new otherwise you know it's just a, a copy of a copy of a copy otherwise you're making a product that you know is going to sell rather than like pushing into your edges as a creator thank you yeah that, so i i see we have a question from casper as well and uh, just before we go to casper just want to mention uh, some people have probably noticed that we are doing a raffle for allowable spots for the next upcoming mint. So to enter it, please retweet the pinned tweet, the, the one that says opportunity number three. And then we'll talk more about uh, upcoming mints and the rest uh, in a minute. But yeah, Casper. So yeah, thanks. Thanks, Anna, for joining us. Uh, I'm just completely floored and impressed by not just the art, but the scale of this project. So kudos to both you and, and Matt for that. I'm, I'm really interested to find out, like, because after listening to what you described about how much effort it takes for you to do a piece, like I'm not an artist at all, but I can appreciate how much work and effort goes into each piece. And, but I'm a numbers guy, right? I, I love numbers and I can see that that supposed to be 10,000 pieces. And I think in this release, you are, you have released like, uh, 47 full pieces. Did you ever envision, uh, yourself to be painting this many paintings? That's my first question. And number two, does that, does having, because I again went through, uh, your website and I, I saw that your plan was to release, uh, uh mints every month. Um, does that schedule sort of give you some any pressure uh, and affects you in any way as an artist to deliver the standards that you would uh, require of yourself, the, the extremely high standards that you described just now? So those, those two questions from me. Thank you. Um, okay, <laughs> thank you for those questions. Um, so the first question being, did I ever think that I would be painting these this much? Um, I, I think it's 400 pieces in total, right? That thereabouts. I think it's probably going to be more like, uh, well, if you include like all the ones that I mess up, maybe more like 600 <laughs> or 700. Because <laughs> there's a lot of duds that you guys are never going to see. <laughs> Um, yeah, um, we'll take it. We'll take it. Convert them to <laughs> NFTs and we'll take it. <laughs> um, you know, I, I mean, here's the thing, like I, I am like kind of a freak in a little way. Like I love huge projects. I love 
monumental endeavors. And like Matt was saying, when he came up with this idea to make NFTs, which by the way, I never wanted to do like people have been telling me for years, like you gotta, you gotta make NFTs. And I'm like, no, these, this doesn't make any sense to me. I don't get it. But then when Matt came up with this idea, I'm like, oh, wow. I love this because like this particular, first of all, they're beautiful. And second of all, it's like, it could, this art couldn't exist without the technology, you know, like without being able to like scan it in and like make this beautiful dim- uh, digital image, it would never exist in like real um, or in physical material life. <laughs> um, but um, the idea of doing 10,000, like, just like I love that I love like embarking on heroes journeys that seem like impossible like impossible quest and I always do it with like this sort of hubris and naivete right where I'm like I'm gonna do this and then and then like the reality sits in and it's super challenging but I'm really embracing it with this project and I don't know um it, it's a lot of work, but honestly, I, the enormity of the challenge really fuels me. And in terms of is quality affected, I think that was the your second question. Is that the gist of it, Casper? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Like, does the the schedule and the pressure of having to deliver 40, 50 piece, pieces a month affect? Uh, does it stress you out? I don't know. <laughs> Does it affect the quality uh, of the work? Um, I, I can't answer that question because I don't know. I don't know what I would be producing without the the pressure, right? So, um, like to answer that honestly, I I I don't know, but I actually think that it's sort of the project is sort of acting as a crucible in a way. Because the pressure that I feel as an artist isn't so much to just create the paintings, but for to like discover something new every time I go into the studio. That's really the pressure that I feel. And like that really comes from a curiosity. And so sometimes I feel like it... I have, I don't know if I'm like messing with my own mind, but I'll, I'll go into the studio and be like, man, I need to, you know, create 10 to 15 paintings this week. And then, and then that might seem like a lot, but then when I, I tell myself, okay, now you, in these 10 or 15 paintings, like there better be an obvious evolution. Like you better go beyond where you've gone before and so in that way there's like the like this curiosity element that comes in that actually acts as like a driver and keeps me really engaged and excited so sometimes I feel like I don't have and like I could use more pieces to work on I know that sounds crazy but like I I don't feel stressed out so much about that but balancing like running the project and doing all of like the logistics and like that is proving to be more of a challenge because it gets really noisy in my head but I need to be very still in my studio so I'm learning how to dance with that a bit I'm pretty sure I'll figure it out yeah thanks very much for those insights uh Really appreciate you sharing it. It must be really difficult and challenging, but I'm hearing that it that the challenges are actually what's pushing you guys forward. So definitely kudos to you and Matt. Thanks, yeah. and I have to I have to give kudos to Matt because I just I just have to say this like like we are very different. He's like he's so um, intelligent when it comes to you know the. Um, the the gamification and the logistics of this project and he's he's very like uh he's really smart in a way that um i'm 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 not quite there yet you know and so without him like 
like he really was the visionary behind scales he came up with the idea and you know like I guess like I would act as a sounding board but I feel like like I'm providing the art you know um but it almost seems that even though it's beautiful like I I maybe you guys could tell me how you feel about this but I feel like the the utility of this project and the the gaming aspect of it and the community building aspect of it kind of even overshadows the art in a way and it's actually more potent and more powerful and so i don't i don't know i just have to give credit to matt because he is the he is the visionary on all of that you're so sweet <laughs> you're so sweet oh my yeah um it's been quite the Herculean effort to put together all of the pieces and make them work as one in a unified way. And it's really just been my honor to be able to construct an infrastructure that is worthy of Anna's work. And so for that, I'm super grateful and uh, just excited to see how the process evolves. And uh, I think we've, we've achieved a lot. We've, we've knocked out some of the hard parts, you know, uh, the development of the technology and making sure everything flows and works together was such a challenge and has been stressful at times, but just a very beautiful experience. I'm, I'm grateful to be able to uh, play my role here and um, and make this happen for everybody. Yeah, so I think I speak for everyone that we we love both the art and the gamification and the project and and you guys. So so yeah, this is is really great. And uh, let's see, we have uh, before we dive into kind of more of the gamification aspect. I think we we should cover that as well. Um, as, uh, we have one more question from Nanas. Well, actually, I have two questions. Uh, thank you. Um, so the first question is, um, I'm a little bit um, interested in the team behind. So I have read on the website there that you have a lot of roles with persons that have the title Digital Alchemist. So could you please <laughs> explain me what this is? And then the second question, I have um, read on Instagram, I think, that there was once a collaboration with a bear. Uh, from the woods, so please tell me also this story. Awesome. So uh, if if uh, if I can, I'll I'll explain the digital alchemy part, and then Anna can tell you about the bear incident. Is that yeah? Does that work? But we have to say like some <laughs> yeah, of our team is some of our team is here. I see Marissa's here, and um, uh, <laughs> Chris is here as well. Uh, I see her, and so some of some of the digital alchemists are here. Oh, Barbie is here too. There she is. Okay, so we have several of our digital alchemists here, and they are the most integral part of creating the NFT works. So what we do is when a painting is complete and it's dry, it gets scanned. Uh, that part I actually uh, conduct. So what we do is we take the painting, we scan it in, Oftentimes it requires scanning it in multiple pieces. And so we will take the uh, complete image and then I run a process that I just call scaling the painting. And what that entails is making sure that the size of the painting digitally is uniform. And then I will divide it up into the scales. From there, we take those images and they are uploaded into a team folder where our digital alchemy team chooses a painting to work on for the week. And what they will do is download each individual scale and they bring that into Photoshop, whereby they will begin the editing process. Um, any kind of color, lighting, or levels that need to be adjusted are completed before they are turned into scales in order to get the most true to life color 
and lighting on the entire painting. Uh, once they are divided, turned into scales, and uploaded, and the team downloads them to their workstations, they begin the process of cleaning any kind of flaws or, um, the, shall we say, uh, like there are there are several things that need to be edited out. They include um, grains of pigment in the paint. They include pock marks uh, from the drying process. They include uh, being out here in the woods. Sometimes we have bugs that run across the wet paint or we have, uh, you know, dust and things in the air that are become visible once they're scanned in. These are elements of the painting that are not clear uh, with the naked eye. But once it is scanned in at such high resolution, it becomes uh, an apparent part of the work. So in that sense, we work very hard. Our digital alchemists are the real stars of the show because they go in and they create the finished work by removing the dust, by removing the pock marks and any kind of flaws or defects digitally. And once that process is complete, the finished images are re-uploaded to the shared folder we then download them and uh, they become the nfts that you now have in your wallet so that's the the gist of the digital alchemists they are fantastic wonderful we love every single person on our team and i'd like to just give a public shout out to every single one of them right now you guys are the best we love you yeah we love you <laughs> They're awesome. And they're all actually they're all people that we know, uh, people that I've known for a long time. They're all friends of ours who are just volunteering and who are taking this leap of faith with us. So, I mean, that says a lot. They're all donating, you know, their time um, for this idea with this like every, it just blows my mind that people, everyone is willing to like invest in this idea i just i pinch myself i can't believe it it's amazing so i love all you guys if you're listening awesome and and then we need to hear about the beer right <laughs> yeah that's so crazy <laughs> it's um so you know as as you guys are aware we live we live up in the mountains and um and I have a studio that has walls now. We um, actually, Matt d built it for me at the beginning of this year. Um, but before that, I my studio was a glamping tent that was on this platform kind of nestled onto the side of a mountain about like half a mile away from where our cottage is. And... Um, and it was it was great. I loved it. I love this tent. It's amazing. Um, but I was I was doing these paintings in there, and um, I did a lot in one day. And I ran out of table space and easel space, and even I I brought in these plywood boards to tack paintings. So I had like a, a totally manic day, and I was drawing these paintings on on the floor. And so I zipped up the tent and I left and, um, and I came back the next day and there was a, a box of old rags that I had, like turpentine rags that, I, that was inside my tent, was outside my tent. And um, there, it was just strewn all over. And I was like, oh, crap, like something got in there and dragged like this box out what was it and I was so confused because you know you live out here you know don't keep any food in your tent or whatever but so I go in and I see there are pink and purple big paw prints all over the floor of my studio I'm just what the hell and I can see you can tell because it has like five little finger pads that's it was a bear paw print. And what had happened was a bear had been attracted by the scent of this all natural turpentine I use. 
this turpentine is amazing. It's so pure that some people actually drink it as medicine and it smells like a pine forest. It's incredible. And it smells very sweet, like honey. And the bear had been attracted by the scent of my turpentine, had broken into my tent and had perfectly placed a paw print in the middle of one painting. And then on another painting, left um, claw marks. And it's so crazy because, first of all, the bear improved both of the paintings. And even one of our digital alchemists here, I showed it to her and she's like, wow, that bear has a good eye. That's Barbie. <laughs> and um, yeah, so it was like this really special experience because at the time, um, you know, I'd been consumed with this idea of collaborating with nature. And I was really torn about my abstract works. And on one side of my studio, I was making these flower mandalas that I was, um, I, I wanted to create art from seed. So I would grow the flowers from seed and then pick the petals and dry and press the petals and then make mandalas out of them. And I was like, okay, that's collaborating with nature. And then on the other side of my studio, it was just chaos. And it was like oil paints and what you see, what you see now, which is like a very chaotic, messy process. And I felt like that wasn't a collaboration with nature. But then this bear came in and literally collaborated with me on one of my paintings. And it, at that moment, I was like, I mean, call me superstitious, but I was like, oh, like I felt like I was being given permission that to see this as a collaboration with nature, that maybe it doesn't have to do with actually using natural materials, but really... Um, like uh, embodying, um, embodying presence and, of course, generosity and, um, and abundance and creativity in the process of creation. So that's the whole story about that. Thank you. That's amazing. <laughs> oh, so much fun. And, and yeah, what, what a collaboration. So... Uh, and we also have a question from the Scales Discord. So uh, is the bear painting a part of Scales? Uh, no, the bear painting is not part of Scales. In fact, um, just a week before we um, started this project um, or launched this project, a friend of ours came out and um, he fell in love with the painting and it just really touched me and so um he offered to buy it and and i accepted i still have one more painting that i don't know what i'm gonna do with i almost feel like it's blasphemy to give the second one away <laughs> or to to sell the second one but i sold the first one the blue one with the paw print and actually turned it into an nft as well so i gave him I gave him the physical painting as well as um, an NFT that I minted on foundation. So I was like, maybe one day, you know, like you can, you know, keep the physical and maybe somebody will want the NFT. And he's like, what? I want to keep both of them forever. <laughs> so <laughs> that felt good. Nice. Thanks, Jan. And I think um, speaking of NFTs, we should also dig into the, the gamification aspect of the project, uh, which is also an important part of it. So um, why don't you, Matt, give us kind of a, a summary of, of the gamification aspect and how this came about, like uh, collect four in a row. What's, uh, what's the background for, for this idea? Okay, yeah, for sure. So um, as I mentioned, we were already consigned to doing the project before the idea of gamifying it in any way came about. And really, I was looking for a way to engage the community beyond just the art itself. And so I thought of various ways that could be accomplished and at some point settled on having people collect multiple panels in order to receive rewards. And so 
when I initially put it together. Um, I think before I had decided on anything, um, you know, putting together multiple pieces was going to be the thing. And then just deciding how many pieces would be ideal was uh, like the next evolution of it. And so once I settled on four pieces in a row, it seemed fitting because um, there are some paintings that are square and you wouldn't be able to collect more than four in a row, but four would take you all the way across the painting or down the painting. So we settled on four as being the number that would be collected in order to join the royalty club. And the whole idea was a concept, you know, thinking about it more and more in theory, we had an idea of how it would work. In practice, it's been absolutely phenomenal to see the things we've discussed around the game theory and uh, and the gamification coming to life. It's one thing when you have an idea, uh, but I was I was talking with one of our digital alchemists yesterday, Marissa, and she said, you know what's fascinating here is that we 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 have the ideas and the ideas um they seem like they're going to work but we don't live in a vacuum and so once we put it out into the world and the reality begins to align with the discussions around the idea it's just a fabulous thing to witness and still you know we have ideas about maybe how this will work out into the future but uh it's all a mystery when it comes to how it will actually play out and i think that's one of the most intriguing parts of the project is that this is a big experiment and it's something that's never been tried before. It's never been done in this way. And so to witness the unfolding of the process and uh, how the gamification works psychologically for people is just so fascinating to me. Um, witnessing it is is really a privilege. So that's how the idea sort of came about. It was just a natural uh, a natural evolution of looking for a way to go beyond just the art and to go beyond just the art and, um, you know, to build community around the project. So without the gamification aspect, um, I'm not sure we would be able to build such a fabulous community. Uh, and, you know, it's it's really one of the integral parts of the entire project that sort of brings it all together very poetically. Uh, so yeah. that's how it came about. And I'd be happy to, like, answer some questions about the game theory involved. Uh, if, if anybody has anything specific that they'd like to ask about, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. And people can also post questions in Discord either Angel Swing Discord or Scales Discord. I have them all open on like five different screens. So <laughs> <laughs> we will catch it. Um, so I also want to remind people of the raffle. Um, retweet this uh, the tweet that we've pinned uh, called Opportunity Number 3. There are 17 retweets at the moment and two winners. So really good odds uh, on that one. And uh, I think... I think I speak for everyone in the Genesis crew that been to the first round that we would all love more mints uh, <laughs> because <laughs> this has been like a very, is it possible to say like addictive <laughs> experience <laughs> like at least for the last couple of weeks? It's been, it's been like waking up, looking at uh, new listings, have people reply to my DMs. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> and it's been so great. And people have been really great, good at putting together sets as well. I think there's something like 20 total sets. So, uh -huh. um, and what were your expectations before um, Mint on kind of how fast this would progress and, and how easy or hard it would be compared to what you're seeing? I think I 
was very careful not to forge any specific expectations. Um, it's a beautiful thing when you can just let go of all expectations and just say, whatever is going to happen is going to happen. Um, the only thing we can do is continue to cultivate a positive environment and put forward the vibe that we want to see in the community. Uh, it's been really nice to see people working together and it's been a little bit unexpected how close people are working together in the space and to see the different strategies that are developing as part of the idea of collecting four in a row has blown my mind to some degree because I mean, I don't think I quite expected, you know, um, such a collaborative effort. And it's been so cool to watch uh, people you know, getting together, developing the the spreadsheet, developing all of the different tools that help people contact one another and work with each other to conduct, uh, you know, purchases and trades of one another's works. And so as far as expectations go, I try not to have any, of course, you know, it, it is something that we want to see succeed. And so, um, we are hopeful of a certain result, but as far as expectant, I would hesitate to say that I have personally had many, if any, um, solid expectations. Just it's an experiment. And the more detached you can be from a result in any experiment, the more pure those results will be. So, you know, at times we have been tempted to almost interfere with the experiment by helping people find other collectors, things like that. But we always have to come back to center and remind ourselves that we are the, um, the creators of the experiment, but we should not be directing the experiment in any specific way. Uh, otherwise we may taint the results. So we are supportive of different ideas that are born from the community, different ways to collaborate, different ways to collect. And we are open and supportive to all of that. And, um, you know, our idea is just to facilitate the will and desire of the community's collection efforts. So I think that's been um, sort of the overarching thought process for me. And um, as far as you know, going into the gamification of it and the different techniques, I'd be I'd be happy to explore if, if anybody wants to discuss what they've experienced in terms of collecting and um, collaborating with the community. That'd be really great. Um, sometimes it can be fairly sterile when we are looking at the data, because from our point of view, we can see the different wallet addresses. We can see the different transactions that are occurring on chain. We can explore ether scan and, you know, see different names of the community that are trading and strategizing, but to get the insight behind that, is oftentimes fantastic. Um, you know, yesterday I was talking with Radis, one of the members of our community, and he was going in depth about the behind the scenes uh, shenanigans and strategy, as he called it, uh, to be able to collect four in a row and what it actually requires. And he had such a complex strategy that it it really, it was almost confusing me to hear about his strategy because it was like, okay, there are four in a row, but I can also make a column, but I have a trade in play that I've promised. And I don't know if I want to make an offer yet on this particular piece or reveal a thing. And, and it was all very complex. And to see that level of strategy is something I didn't quite expect and has been delightful to see occur. So if anybody wants to come up and talk about uh, some of the details of the actual strategy and how they've collaborated or worked with other people, that'd be really cool to hear about. Yeah, absolutely. And we can also 
uh, go into a bit more detail about how we've approached it in the, the angel swing, uh, if anyone wants to to hear more about that. So, so yeah. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, so um, while people either request to speak or or um, or uh, ask in the discords, so 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 basically you started it is espresso. So you have to explain what what you have created. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, so we we actually ended up forming a DAO, which is uh, fun. That's the first uh, for us and and uh, a lot of fun. Uh, but yeah, so back up to kind of uh, the mint date we. Um, so we, we have a Discord where we kind of hang out every day, uh, chat about anything, everything, and also uh, share e information about upcoming interesting projects. And the Scales project was uh, shared. And uh, actually, um, a fair amount of people in the Angel Swing Discord ended up um, getting to Mint. So then when we minted, we shared, OK, hey, I went to this amazing artwork. And then um, quickly we realized that, oh, we have been minting a lot of stuff in this uh, this group. Uh, do we have any four in a row? Which we didn't. Um, and and then next question was, okay, but if we want to try to make four in a row, we can we can swap internally, like uh, that, that would be great. Uh, so we quickly kind of got started with a, a thread and uh, a pinned message with um, listing all the pieces that we had minted. I think we were something like 10 people, give or take, that had minted. So um, that was a, a good start. Um, and then we dove in and, and tried to figure out, OK, um, given this set of scales, where's the best potential to actually form a set? And we, we tried to figure out, OK, who's, who's owning these scales that we don't have? And um, side note, that, that has been a very fun aspect of this as well. Like the, the amount of investigative work <laughs> to find people, oh man, uh, and the DMs and the, the uh, trading uh, negotiations and and uh, sales and strategies. So, and and I have to say, kind of, the, some people are are uh, fairly easy to find. Uh, the ones you mentioned, the spreadsheet, which is great, the one that's in Scales Discord, people list what they have. So that's easy, right? If uh, if a piece is on there, then uh, it's easy to reach people. And then you have on the entire other end of the spectrum, the burner wallet with two scales in it. <laughs> and <laughs> and no, no names, no Twitter, no nothing. And they're not in this card. Oh, we spent so much time trying to track down who, who, what, when, where. Um, <laughs> and, and it's been so much fun. So, so yeah, we, we, had a blast trying to get kind of full sets together. Um, and eventually we managed to put some full sets together uh, by collaborating. We were kind of treating this pinned message with all our scales as a, as a pool of scales. Of course, uh, some um, members chose to buy additional ones and, and, and others relied on trading. That's perfectly fine. And then when we had some full sets, we had collaborated to form them, so kind of they, they belong to us, not individual members. Uh, we kind of had to pool our scales. So then we figured, OK, let's create a multi-sig wallet, put them in there, and uh, call it a DAO. So that was kind of a quick summary of of uh, how that came about. And, and um, yeah, and uh, by the way, um, it's kind of only that pool of 10 people that's participated that are in the DAO. We're not um, open for new members at the moment. Um, but yeah, we're, we're having a blast collecting. Fabulous. Fabulous. Yeah, it's really cool to hear some insight into how that came about. And uh, very interesting, the, the, the game theory. Maybe this can lead us sort of into the the realm of the game theory conversation. But, um, you know, it's very, very interesting seeing a group of people working together uh, to to cooperate and form sets. When Anna and I discussed how 
the game would work in theory, we had an idea that people may decide to work together. Um, we did not foresee a group of 10 people working together. Um, I think our imagination stopped at, well, maybe there will be a couple people, maybe even, you know, small group of three, maybe four people would know each other and uh, be motivated to work together in a collaborative way to form sets. And so when we saw the DAO form, it was quite the surprise and a pleasant surprise, but quite the surprise to see that there were groups of people that are working together in the Web3 space already um, that could collaborate on a level like this. And as far as the, the whole game theory goes, it's a supremely interesting thing to study and to look into because, you know, on the one hand, by collaborating and cooperating, you end up with potentially more sets by going that route. But on the same hand, or on, on the other hand, but in the same vein, uh, you will have to share rewards. And so to to see what that balance becomes is ultimately one of the, the most curious parts of the project. And, um, you know, we've, uh, we've discussed all of the different outcomes that could occur. And, uh, I, I think that it's fabulous. However it goes is going to be an experience and we're going to watch it unfold. Um, it's very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, indeed, and um, I think uh, we are kind of approaching the end of the. We try to keep to an hour, and we're slightly above that, and it, it's super interesting. So, but uh, let's hear uh, like a, a couple of details about the upcoming mint, uh, just to to close off with that. And if there's any other questions, then we can take them at the end. Okay, great. I have a couple details on the upcoming Mint. It is on the 23rd of July. Um, that's at 1 p.m. Universal Standard Time. And if you're in the Discord, you can look in the drop calendar for your local time. Uh, I've attached a Unix code in there, so it will show you uh, what your local time is based on the, the time clock on your computer if you go and you look at that. Um, there will be 660 scales released in this drop. And for the most part, um, we have the list completely full. We are overbooking by somewhere close to about 20%. So anybody who is on the list and will be minting on the 23rd, I would recommend uh, coming early if you can, trying to get they're closer to the beginning of the uh, drop or of the mint. Uh, and also in that way, I think gas prices will be the lowest uh, closer to the time that we've scheduled the mint to begin. As the day goes on, typically you see gas prices go up around, well, probably about four hours after the mint starts is about the time we've historically seen gas prices go up throughout the day. So I would say if you want to guarantee your spot in the mint show up early and also if you want to pay less gas to mint also show up early um those are the details on that and i don't know if anna has anything to say about the work in this next drop but i can i can tell you that <laughs> the pieces in this next drop some of them are just jaw dropping there's been certainly <clears throat> an evolution of the work from the last drop to this one. And um, maybe I'll let her speak on that a little bit. Yeah, I, I think you'll you'll be starting to see some like deviations in style from the last drop. Um, and <laughs> it's, it's so hard because I'm putting out work um that i've made i made this i don't know three or four months ago and i'm like oh man like i wish i could put out the newer stuff now but y'all gotta wait for that um but um yeah i'm just really excited for the next drop like matt said it is just really embracing the unknown um 
because it's web three is already, you know, the wild west as it is. I think it changes so quickly in even this project. I'm just blown away by like, <laughs> I'm, I just have to say, I'm, I'm blown away and I feel so honored by everybody who has, who is here today, who is like, love scales who is participating who is having fun seeing people having fun is probably the most gratifying thing and also seeing like the most beautiful like acts of generosity of spirit or generosity of you know your your own funds i see gift giving i see people helping each other and um as this project evolves like i mean it's inspiring me i'm like what more can i give like how can i make this even more exciting and more awesome for the community and what else can we do to make to make everything more gratifying and more fun and i just want to throw it out there um I know you, you know, the community is, I feel like this project belongs to you in a way, like you're, you're building it, everyone who participates in it, builds it and makes it what it is. And, and we are sort of like pulling the strings behind the scenes. We're, we have the power to, you know, we have a platform that it's still kind of, you know, it's still growing. It's still in its infancy. But if any of you have any ideas or are inspired or think that, you know, can think of anything to enhance or um, foster the growth or like anything, this is a full on collaboration please feel totally free to express yourself. Um, you can always reach me by DM or Matt, or you can, you know, hit us up on Discord, whatever. But um, I just wanted to to honor everybody that's here and to say that, like, you you all are building this and I want to give give you credit and also feel like you have a platform to speak as well. So that's that's my two cents. Beautifully said, and I completely concur with that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's uh, amazing final uh, comments, and and uh, we will um, end here uh, with a big thank you to Matt and Anna for joining, and all of the digital alchemists and everything, everyone, the devs, the team, and the community that uh, showed up here today to listen in and um and yeah join the discord um chat with matt and anna and and everyone else and thank you so much oh, thank you thank you everybody and thank uh, one you. last one last thing i'll say is uh just in about the uh, announcement of who wins the spots we'll announce that both on twitter and discord as soon as we drive back up to our cabin from the uh, signal spot here on the mountain will be doing the draw and we will announce that for everybody so stay tuned thank you very much Amazing. Matt and Anna it's our pleasure thank you it's Anna. a pleasure thank you thank you. thank you we love you guys we love you <laughs> <laughs> okay everybody thanks a lot thank you bye 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 okay bye bye <laughs> Well, uh, in time, time. Well, uh.